Good morning and welcome to worship here with the people of St. John United Church of Christ in Robinson, Texas, where we begin every service by reminding you that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are always welcome here. A few announcements before we start this morning. As you'll see, it is a communion Sunday, so please go ahead and get some bread and grape juice or wine ready so that you can partake in communion with us a little later on in the service. A few prayer needs and praises this morning. Uh, first of all, at the time of filming, Ted Newman is in the hospital uh, getting some checkups on his heart, and so we will continue to pray with him and more information will be available as we can get it. Uh, secondly, I'd like to congratulate my parents. Uh, it is their birthday this week. They actually have the same birthday two years apart, so we want to wish them a happy birthday. Any other announcements in the life of our church, please email to me and let me know, and I'll be glad to announce it in this time. Well, as you know, church council met this week and uh, our major decision was deciding on a reopening plan. Before I get to the specifics of that plan, let me emphasize two points wholeheartedly. If you do not feel safe yet to return to church, or if you feel sick at all, please, please continue to stay home. We will continue to live stream our services. It will look a little different than it does right now, but I will set up my phone so that you can continue to see the service live as it happens on Facebook. And secondly, this plan is all contingent on McLennan County's COVID numbers remaining very low. We're going to reassess this plan monthly or if needed weekly and if our numbers spike very high, we will be closing again. Your safety is our first priority. God can be worshipped in a number of ways and in a number of places, so we are concerned with your safety. But because McLennan County's COVID numbers have remained exceptionally low around the same point for the last month and a half or so, and because the state of Texas uh, COVID testing rate is remaining about the same, we have decided to move forward with a very cautious and measured reopening plan. Let me go through some of the highlights. You'll be receiving a letter in the mail uh, here in the next week or so that uh, goes into a bit more detail about some of our restrictions. Uh, but let me go forward with a brief summary. We're looking at, again, if the number's staying low, coming back here to these pews for in-person worship June 28th. That's the final Sunday in the month of June. We will have no coffee hour fe fellowship time before or after the service. There will be no in-person Sunday school for adults or children. We will unlock the doors to the church about 20 or 15 minutes before the service so that that gives you time to get in and find your seat, but does not allow us to congregate an hour early in the assembly room. After worship, we ask that uh, as you leave, you just head on out of the building and don't congregate here. If you'd like to say hi to some of your friends, you can do so on the church lawn from a safe distance. We're going to go ahead and ask that you please wear a mask as you come to worship with us. Uh, please bring your own. We have a very limited supply available here as well. If you are in need of a mask, uh, we would love for everyone to stay safe in that manner. Hand sanitizer, as always, will be available as you enter. Please make use of that before and after the service and wash your hands thoroughly and frequently. Doctors are telling us that the worst way to spread COVID is group singing. You may have recently seen the news article of the very large church choir that 
uh, was deeply impacted by COVID just from one infected person who came to practice. But because they had all been singing together, breathing together, pushing out particles from their mouth, more than half the choir was infected and two people died. And so for the moment, we will not be singing together. We will have some instrumental music at the beginning and end of the service and a solo in the middle. If you're interested in singing that middle solo, please reach out to me, email me, call me. I would love to put you on the schedule to sing some special music for us in these difficult days. As far as distancing within the sanctuary, every other pew will be taped off so that we can maintain some front to back distance. Maintaining side to side distance is also important. So please sit a family to a pew or at the very least one person way over here and one person way over there. Bulletins uh, will continue to be used. We will print them out several days before the service and spread them out in the assembly room. Uh, this will prevent an usher having to touch the paper that you're about to touch. And so we ask you to please just grab the bulletin that you will be using uh, in the assembly room as you come in. We're going to ask that we not use the hymnals and Bibles and worship books here in the pews for right now. Uh, we will print everything you need in your bulletin, uh, and for the moment, we're not going to use these books to avoid the spread of germs. Finally, there will be an offering plate available in the back so that we don't have to all pass a common plate. Uh, this is important. We will still dedicate the offering during the service. We'll just ask that you put your donation in either before or after the service with an offering plate in the back. We will also have some special considerations for communion that we will get to once we get to a communion Sunday. I know that that is a lot of restrictions and regulations. Remember this, that even as we meet together in this space and even as we celebrate that, worship will not look the same for quite a while. We're making all of these changes to keep you and your family safe. If at any point you don't feel safe or you feel sick, please do not come to church. Please simply watch online. With all that being said, if everything goes well, I look forward to and will rejoice in seeing you here June 28th. We're going to begin our online service today in a little bit of a different manner. Our consulting conference minister, Campbell Lovett, has recorded uh, an opening welcome and invocation that we will now share with you at this time. Friends in Christ, good morning. My name is Campbell Lovett. I'm serving as the consulting conference minister for the South Central Conference of the United Church of Christ. I'm so grateful for Pastor Jacob's invitation to join you virtually for worship this morning uh, and to bring greetings to St. John's United Church of Christ in Robinson. Uh, it is good to greet you and to uh, give thanks to God for your presence, for your mission and ministry in the community as you seek to love all, welcome all, and seek justice for all. Friends, as you know, we live in one of the most challenging times that most any of us can even remember. Uh, the pandemic, this COVID-19, which has meant that we need to protect the vulnerable and care for the least of these, which is the work of the church, uh, but it's meant that we've had to practice adaptive change and look at worship differently, look at the way we meet differently, uh, and, and be the church uh, deployed in the world. On top of that, we seem to be at a tipping point around issues of racial justice. Uh, and my prayer is that uh, those who are moving forward to call us to a time of acknowledgement of systemic racism 
uh, and the way our institutions too often are based on uh, an unequal representation of people, that this can be a time of change. But you know, in all of that, we can't do that work by ourselves. We can't uh, fight this virus. We can't uh, stop systemic racism all by ourselves as one church. And so I'm so grateful for uh, a conference like the South Central Conference that's seeking to generate a lot of resources and help our churches with strategies of regathering. Uh, and I'm grateful for churches like St. John seeking to be active and involved in the community uh, and, and support and remind folks that we're stronger together. And then I'm grateful for uh, the national setting of the United Church of Christ that continues to call us to respond to issues uh, of justice uh, that need our collective attention. It's good to be a part of a denomination where we can work together to try to make the lives of all people uh, better, more productive, and more loving. And so please join me in this prayer uh, of the Pentecost season, uh, as we gather for worship, we invoke together the Holy Spirit, uh, this prayer from our United Church of Christ Book of Worship. Let us pray. We thank you, living God, that in Jesus Christ you have built a house not made with hands, a people among whom you live. We thank you that you have called us and that we belong to you. We gather now in this virtual service of worship, longing to know the touch of your Holy Spirit, that we may be encouraged to serve you in the world. Come to us that we may recognize you and sing your praise. Through the grace of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. I hope our time of worship today is uh, energizing, that gives us the word we need to hear and that the good news of Jesus Christ continues to inspire us in the weeks ahead uh, until our next service of worship. Uh, but until then, uh, may God bless you and keep you. And thank you for this opportunity of greetings. Peace. Well, as we have already mentioned, it is a communion Sunday. We never want to approach the table of the Lord in an unworthy manner or without examining our own hearts. And what better time than right now to examine our hearts. So please join me in confessing our sins before God and hearing the comforting words of the gospel. Holy God, we confess that we have not always worshipped you in spirit and in truth. We have sinned against you in thought, in word, and in deed, in things we have done, in things left undone. Help us to approach your altar with praise and prayer. Amen. Let us pray before the Lord in silence. Children of God, hear the gospel. Jesus Christ has forgiven us that we might be made new and live resurrected lives. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And amen. It's now time for the children's sermon, so I'd ask if you have a child watching with you that you Bring them on forward and have them lean in for a moment as we share this time together. Well, good morning, St. John kids. I'm so glad to get to talk with you this morning. I'm especially thinking of Isaac and Isla, Harper and America, and any other child that is watching online today. Welcome. I'm glad that you're here. Well, this is a question that may go a little better at home than it would in the sanctuary. I want to ask you this morning, how old you think your parents or whoever takes care of you, how old you think they are? Go ahead and say it. 
You know, sometimes we tend to underguess. We think that our parents, you know, may be younger than they are. Sometimes we may think that our parents are older than they are. But in our Bible story today, we have some very, very old parents. In fact, these parents were so old that they didn't think they could have a baby anymore. These are some names you've probably heard before, Sarah and Abraham. And when they, when they were already past the age of having children, God promised them that God would make of them a nation greater than the number of stars in the sky. In today's story, they've been following God for years with that promise and still haven't had a baby. Abraham's probably about a hundred years old here, and Sarah, his wife, is probably about 90. And in the story, God again tells them today, you will have a baby. And Sarah does basically the only thing that makes sense. She laughs. She says, I'm not going to have a baby. I'm very old. But God says something amazing. In response, God says, is anything too wonderful for God? And that's what I want you to think about this week, St. John kids. Is anything too wonderful? Is anything too hard for God to do? And so as you look at the world around you and you see problems that are so hard to solve, I want you to think to yourself, is there anything that is too hard for God to do? And you know what? The answer is no. That God has called the church together in every corner and part of the world to solve these big problems and to be part of the world's healing. And you know what? God's called you to be part of that too. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you that nothing is too hard for you. We pray that you will use us to make this world a better place. Amen. Well, amen. Well, I will see you next week. Have a great day. Well, this morning we start a new season a new series. As you know, the time of Lent and Easter and Pentecost have now passed. We now enter into that great time of the church known as ordinary time. The color for this is obviously green. You'll be seeing quite a lot of this over the next six months or so. But just because this time is titled Ordinary, don't think that that means that God has stopped working, or that perhaps these days will somehow be mundane. For the original meaning of ordinary was not mundane, but instead ordained. That this time is ordained that we spend maybe about half of the church year reenacting the great story of Jesus and learning from it, and we spend this half of the church year in a time that is ordained for us to set this world right, a time that is ordained for us to allow God to use us to go out to the very corners of this earth and declare good news. For the first six weeks of Ordinary Time, we will be walking through the book of Genesis. Now, Genesis has some 50 chapters. We're not going to cover all of it in six weeks. But we will look at some highlights and some lowlights from the patriarch stories, the matriarch stories, these stories that remind us of the great leaders that the Israelites look back on time and time again. These great formation stories of our faith. We'll see where they succeeded and where they failed. We'll focus on the voices of women in a way that maybe we have forgotten in the book of Genesis before. 
Today's reading will pick up in the middle of a story. Abraham and Sarah have been following God for many years now. God had promised them an offspring more numerous than the stars, and they had begun to follow God in the wilderness. At the point where we pick up today's story, some visitors have come to check in on Abraham. There's a great debate on who exactly these visitors are. The text sometimes says that the Lord is speaking and sometimes says that the visitors who have come to seek Abraham and Sarah are speaking. Nevertheless, let us engage this story fully. Our reading today is Genesis 18, 9 through 15, and then 21, 1 through 7. Hear what the Spirit is still saying to God's church. The visitors said to Abraham, Where is your wife, Sarah? And he said, There, in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife, Sarah, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord. At the set time, I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, Oh yes, you did laugh. Picking up in chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. The Lord dealt with Sarah as God had said, And the Lord did for Sarah as God had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to his son, whom Sarah bore him. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Now Sarah said, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, who would ever have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. Sisters and brothers, these words are true and can be trusted. Thanks be to God. Sarah laughed. This is one of the only times in scripture I can think of knowing that a woman is laughing. Anytime women in scripture are given this much freedom to speak and to laugh and to be joyful and to be sad, we should pay close attention. For God is doing a new thing. And often when God brings about a new thing in scriptures, God does so through the women. Sarah is an extremely important character in Genesis and indeed throughout the rest of the Bible. Scholars say that there is no woman mentioned more in the text of scripture than Sarah, wife of Abraham. Her name is mentioned many, many times here in Genesis and even beyond in other books of the scriptures. This is a story that we know bits and pieces of very well. The scriptures spend quite a bit of time talking about Sarah and Abraham's journey. And before we move on, I would just like to say that I greatly admire Sarah's great faith. We've talked before about Abraham's great faith. I've preached before when we've looked at the book of Hebrews on Abraham's great faith. 
Abraham heard God who he did not know in the previous land and followed God into the wilderness at an old age. But if there's one person in this story who perhaps has even more faith than Abraham, it is Sarah. Because you see, Sarah follows God into the wilderness too, but does not have the advantage of usually hearing God face to face and ear to mouth. You see, Sarah follows God in a way that she doesn't even have to hear God. This is what makes Sarah's faith so great. And before we move on today, I have a feeling that there is somebody watching this sermon who hasn't heard from God in a long time. Perhaps you've stopped even believing that God speaks and that God moves in this world. Maybe you haven't seen or heard from God in years. Sibling in Christ, God sees your struggle. God also sees your faithfulness to keep putting one foot in front of the other and keep walking even when the way is dark, even when the path is uncharted. Yes, Abraham had great faith, but he saw and communicated with God quite often. Sarah perhaps has even greater faith because she followed without this great communication from God. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, God is with you, child of God. And even when God is silent, just keep walking. Perhaps one day you will find you've made it a lot further than you ever thought that you could. But as we think about Sarah today, we come to this story. Abraham and Sarah have now been following God for years. They've been wandering through the wilderness trying to find that promised land that God had for them. They've been trying to figure out what God meant when God said that they would have innumerable children. They were both far too old to be having kids. And so they thought perhaps God meant that Abraham would have a child with their slave, Hagar. So Hagar's son, Ishmael, has already been born at this point. This, of course, leads to much family tension we will speak of next week. But for this week, Abraham and Sarah are spending a normal day together when mysterious visitors come to meet them. These are the same visitors that very soon will be treated horribly in Sodom and Gomorrah. But these visitors come and find Abraham and Sarah and begin to speak prophetically. Abraham being let's face it, a bit of a misogynist, sends Sarah into the tent to make these visitors some food, to get them some snacks ready because they're going to be here for a little while. Sarah, being the faithful woman that she is, keeps her ear to the side of the tent to hear what they might be saying. They have a conversation about God's faithfulness and finally the topic moves to Sarah. These visitors then make it quite clear that God's plan is that Sarah will conceive. Not only did Hagar have a son, but God will make sure that Sarah has a son. Now imagine for yourself that you are a 90-year-old woman living in the wilderness and some strangers have just told your husband that you will give birth. You see, sometimes we think that Sarah has little faith for laughing here. I think it's the only appropriate response to someone in their 90s being told that they are going to become pregnant. This deserves a good laugh. It sounds ridiculous. 
I find it amazing how God responds. God is surprised that Sarah is laughing. Abraham himself laughed about this matter only a chapter before this reading. But God is surprised that Sarah is laughing and responds with one of the most beautiful lines in all of Genesis. God responds by saying, Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? Some translations here have it, Is anything too hard for God? St. John, I want you to very seriously ask yourself that question. Is anything too hard for God? We live in incredibly broken and dark times. There is a pandemic virus ravaging the world right now. There are protests and unrest in our streets because some people are still not equal in the United States of America. It would be very easy to look at the world and the condition that it's in and say that this is too hard for God. It would be easy to look at the problems, to lift our hands in the air and simply say, I give up. I'm not working for justice anymore. I'm not fighting for it anymore. I simply can't go on. But this text reminds us that there is nothing, nothing Nothing too hard for our God. Now, this does not mean that God waves a magic wand and fixes every problem. This means that every time that there is brokenness in this world, every time that there is death in this world, every time that this world is as it should not be, that God mobilizes God's people on earth to heal the wound. To bridge the brokenness, to do the hard and difficult internal work of facing our own prejudices and our own sin so that we can reconcile with the world that we have so deeply wounded. Notice in this passage that yes, God promises Sarah a child, but she is still going to have to carry a baby within her for nine months as a 90 year old woman living in the wilderness. God's promises are true and good, and God will bring about what God will bring about. But it's going to take a lot of work on our end, too. Hard work, grueling work. But when we submit ourselves to the Lord, and when we bring about God's own reconciliation on earth, though it will bring us some pain and it will be hard for us to do, at the end of the day, we may find ourselves laughing at just how amazing the promises of God are for us in this place. We pick up the story about two chapters later in chapter 21, and everything works out as it should. Sarah gets pregnant, bears a child. The child is named Isaac. All of a sudden, this 90 and 100 year old couple are going through all the joys and highs and lows and pain and sorrow and laughter that any young family has. Sarah ends the passage by proclaiming with joy, I'm nursing a child at 90. And so through all of the ups and downs, we get this feeling that it was worth it, that God's promise fulfilled in us and in her was worth it. One final closing thought this morning. One thing I didn't know before seminary is the importance of Isaac's name, that the child that Sarah and Abraham have, of course, is named Isaac. And in the original language, this is a bit of a pun because the second syllable sounds exactly like the word for laughter, for joyous chuckles. You see, at one point, Sarah had laughed 
at the audacity and impossibility that God would bring about this new life within her. But now she is laughing with tears of joy that God has brought it to pass. So wherever you are this morning, St. John, there may be issues you are facing that cause you a bit of bitter and sarcastic and cynical laughter. I pray that through the hard work of God's own sanctification, through the hard work of God's own calling, and through the hard work of us taking on the redemption of God in this world, that very soon we will be laughing with tears of joy because we see what God has brought about among us. Join God where God is at work, St. John. You just might be surprised at the laughter it may bring. Amen. Well, St. John, we want to take a moment to sing together this morning as we continue in worship. And as we continue thinking about the concepts we talked about last week in Trinity Sunday, I thought a great hymn to sing this day would be Come Thou Almighty King. These lyrics should be very easy to find online, and I hope that you sing along with me. Let us join together in song, Come Thou Almighty King. this day, the appropriate response is always prayer. In a world so deeply broken, in the midst of so much fear and worry, I invite all of us in this time and in this place to take just a moment to breathe in God's presence, to be still and know that God is with us. So let's take just a moment of silence and then pray together. God beyond all describing, God who has turned our mourning into laughing, we come before you this day each with separate needs on our hearts. 
we bring our world before you, God and all of the world's brokenness and death. Resurrect this place, O oh God, that we may be true agents of your own redemption. We bring our country before you, protesters longing for equality, a virus impacting the most vulnerable. We pray for mercy, O oh God, for true equality and for true health. We pray that you might call us to do the hard work that you have dreamed for us. We pray for our state, for our community, our leaders, and those who work so hard alongside us. We pray for this church, especially for Ted Newman, for all those who are sick, for those who love them and take care of them. Grant them rest. Grant them comfort. O oh Lord, grant them your very presence. For nothing is too wonderful for you. Nothing is too hard. And now we are bold to pray as you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to invite you now, if you are a normal giver to St. John, uh, to please continue in that act. As you know, we are also collecting the Strengthen the Church offering this month. But for now, let us take just a moment to come before the Lord and prepare our hearts to receive Holy Communion. I am so glad that you are joining us as we celebrate at God's own table. Before we begin, I would like to remind you that this table is not our own, that this feast is the Lord's. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, we welcome you to this place to taste and see that the Lord is good. Luke's Gospel records that on the evening of the first day of the week, the same day on which Christ rose from the dead, he was at the table with two disciples on the road to Emmaus. He took bread, blessed, and broke it. And when he gave it to them, their eyes were opened, and they knew the Lord. Beloved, this is the joyful feast of God's people. We come from east, west, north, and south to gather around the table of the Lord. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell in unity. Let us pray. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. We give you thanks, O God, our Father, for creating all that is seen and all that is unseen. You knit us together and called us into being for your own glory. Our lives and our worship are a testament to your goodness. May we bring your good news to the ends of the earth. Therefore, we join in the song of the heavens, singing, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord. God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who makes all things new. Hosanna in the highest. Speaking God, though we were created in your image, we sinned and broke communion with you. But you were unwilling that any should perish and instead sent Christ to save us and invite us to worship at this holy feast. Through the life, example, death, and resurrection of our Savior, we have been invited into fellowship 
with you. Though Christ has ascended, he sent us an eternal advocate in the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the most normal of elements. Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it, saying, this is my body, broken and given for you. In a like manner, after dinner, he poured the cup saying that this is the blood of a new covenant given for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of this, remember me. Let us pray. O oh God, May these gifts of grape and grain be to us eternal food and eternal drink, that we may truly taste and see your goodness, that here in this bread and in this wine we meet you in a new and unique way. May this be food for our journey as we continue to bring your good news to the world. Amen. I'd now like to invite you, wherever you are this morning, to share bread with those who are gathered with you. Simply pass bread and say that this is the body of Christ, broken for you. If you are by yourself this morning, please allow me the honor of spiritually serving you. This is the body of Christ, broken for you. Thanks be to God. In a like manner, please now give one another a drink of the grape juice or wine that you have prepared. If you are by yourself this morning, please allow me the honor of spiritually serving you. This is the blood of Christ, given for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of it, remember him. Let us pray. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. May we who drink this cup bring light to others. May we who the Spirit has set free live into our freedom in this world to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to every broken system and situation. Amen. People of God, it is an honor and a privilege to worship alongside you, and I'm so thankful for the opportunity. I hope to see you next week. Now hear the benediction. This week, St. John, may God take your minds and think through them. May God take your hands and work through them. May God take your lips and speak through them. Oh, may God take your hearts and set them on fire. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.